Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the fourth episode of season six. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode which focused on the crimes of Stephen Port aka the Grinder Killer. I was advised by a couple of my listeners that on the same day that episode was released, it was announced that the Independent Office for Police Conduct said it was going to re-examine how Scotland Yard investigated Stephen Port's killing spree after none of the 17 officers involved in the case faced disciplinary action. Watch this space on that one is all I will say. Before we get into this week's story, let's break the ice a little bit as we always do. The show's first opening icebreaker segment is this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. Here is this week's Dad Fact. When searing meat, brush it with a little olive oil, sea salt and pepper before adding it to the pan. This way, the seasoning stays with the meat and not with the pan. Good advice. Certainly helps with steak. I like to think I cook a mean steak. Medium rare, please. Anything more is overdone. That's a debate for another show. How do you like your meat? No euphemism intended there. The second and final opening icebreaker segment is this. Satsuji Haiku Here is this week's case-related murderous haiku. A Scottish killer. Ritualistic murders. He roams the streets free. A haiku is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of 5, 7 and 5. It's meant to be read in one breath and please feel free to send in your own efforts if you will and I'll read them on a future episode. With my intro icebreakers complete, let's get into it. This week's case was suggested via Instagram DM by listener Keita Wild. We're north of the border once more this week as we're back in Borney, Scotland. Specifically, we're in the South Lanarkshire town of Cambuslang. Here are five quick fire facts about Cambuslang. Number one, it has been suggested that Cambuslang is near where King Arthur won the sixth of his twelve famous battles around 508 CE. Number two, Gilbert Field Castle is located in Cambuslang. It's a ruined 17th century castle in which Scottish poet William Hamilton once lived. William Hamilton translated the epic poem The Wallace, based on the life of Scottish knight Sir William Wallace, from early Scots into modern English. Number three, the Cambuslang Work, formerly known as the Cambuslang Walk, probably saying that wrong, was a massive religious event that took place in 1792 and saw crowds of up to 30,000 people gathering to listen to preachers. Number four, a war memorial sits just inside Cambuslang Park. It's dedicated to the honour of the people from Cambuslang who died in both world wars. And number five, Cambuslang's name may derive from its location on the banks of a large bend on the River Clyde. Cambus literally means bend of the water in Scots, and Lang means long. Long bend, Cambuslang. A mid-2020 report by the National Records of Scotland states the estimated population of Cambuslang as 30,790. Let me quickly advise you that this episode contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners, including graphic details of murder. As always, listener discretion is advised. Our story this week focuses on the crimes of a man named Ian Scowler, and I won't lie, it was a pretty difficult case to research. There's such a limited amount of information out there about this case, especially when it comes to online articles, so I had to rely on the British newspaper archive to figure out the chain of events. Shout out to the British newspaper archive, by the way, as well as the Aberdeen Press and Journal. Without them, this episode simply wouldn't have been possible. There's no exact date of birth available online or in print for Ian Scowler, but based on how old he was when he committed the crimes he did, it's a safe bet to say he was born in 1958. Said to have come from a good and heavily family oriented background, Ian would grow up to become a ruthlessly cold and calculating killer who was perhaps flown right under the mainstream radar. Although there's little information available about what Ian's parents did for work, it's said they were successful in their ventures and their son was the light of their life. They're incredibly protective of him, especially his mother. Having said that, Ian does have an older sister named Morag, who appears to be seven years his elder. It's worth making a note here that the last information available about Ian Scowler is from one article which was written in 2003. 
You'll find out why soon enough, but given his sister was 52 back in 2003 and would therefore now be 71, I'm taking a big leap and speaking in a tense that assumes both she and Ian are still alive to this day. A recluse who has been described as an outsider, Ian would often resort to making up wild stories straight out of his imagination to make up for the fact he had little to no friends throughout his childhood. He showed signs of depression enough times to warrant his parents seeking psychiatric help for him. Nothing appears to have come of the psychiatrist's help and it's unclear whether he was formally diagnosed with depression. This story took place many decades ago, with the timeline of events occurring in late 1982 and early 1983, so how accurate the knowledge of depression was back then is something to perhaps question. At the age of 24, Ian was still living at home with his parents in an end terraced house on Kirkton Road, although he did have a job and brought a salary into the household. He worked as a forklift truck driver at a freighter depot in Rutherglen, another South Lanarkshire town located three miles west and slightly north of Camberslang. Ian proposed to his long-term partner Irina, or possibly Irene, Anderson in the summer of 1981, although she didn't live at the house on Kirkton Road with him and his family. I'll stick with Irina for the remainder of the story. Knowing how protective his mother was of him, that's likely the reason why, or maybe they were both living at their respective parents' homes while they saved up for a place of their own. Background-wise, that's all I've got for you this week, so without further ado, let's get straight into the timeline of events. Let me introduce to you Mrs. Catherine McCord, a 36-year-old taxi driver who lived on Naismith Street in the East Glasgow suburb of Carmyle a mile or so north of Camberslang. Catherine has a rather interesting backstory, and I need to go on a bit of a tangent to tell you it, but I promise it will be worth it. There's one article online with this story, however it was confirmed in an old newspaper, so for the sake of the case, let's assume it's true. Back in 1973, when Catherine was 27, she lived with her husband Eddie, a taxi driver, on a council estate in Bailiston, another East Glasgow suburb. Struggling to make ends meet, the married couple decided to get themselves involved with a scam that would lead to a jail sentence for Catherine. Unable to bear children, Catherine would later say of the scam, I don't really know why I became involved in this. Maybe it would have been different if we could have had children. I don't know. Back then, Catherine worked at the Scottish Daily Express newspaper as an office clerk with a salary of £35 a week. £35 in 1973 is worth about £450 in 2022, so Catherine's annual salary was approximately 23400 before tax in today's money. The average salary in Glasgow in current times is £79,300 a year, so based on that, it's no wonder Catherine felt there was more to life and wanted to aim higher. Later in 1973, she started a new role at the newspaper, Deputy Competitions Clerk, and her new boss was a man named Colin Hunter. Back then, newspapers in the UK used to run weekly competitions called Spot the Ball, in which readers were shown a photograph from a football match, a soccer match to my transatlantic listeners, with the ball removed. Readers would then mark the photo with where they thought the ball was and send in their entry. The winner was the one who got closest to where the ball was and won a cash prize. The Scottish Daily Express offered a weekly prize of £1,500 back then, which is just about £19,000 in 2022. Quite a good sum. Basically, the prize was an annual salary. To cut an unnecessarily long story short, Catherine suggested to her boss Colin that they ran a syndicate made up of her husband Eddie and three of their friends. The plan was for the three friends to pick who won the competition and submit a fake entry form on their behalf with the winning ball placement. The winner would then be handed £200 of the £1,500 total winnings, Generally, they picked someone strapped for cash, so they were more than happy with the £200. From the remaining 1300 Catherine took 500 I'm assuming Eddie shared that with her. Colin took 500 and the three musketeers, for better use of a term, took £100 each. Over a three-year period, Catherine and Colin rigged close to 70 competitions, amassing a total of £143,500, just short of a million quid in today's money, until winner number 67 blew the lid off the whole thing and informed the police. Only around four grand of the funds were recovered and both Catherine and Colin spent three years in prison for their troubles. If it's true, that's one hell of a story, isn't it? 
Apologies for the long digression, I just felt that was too interesting to leave out. Let's get back to where Catherine McCord fits into this week's story. At close to 8pm on Friday October 1st 1982, Catherine was approaching the end of a long shift and had one more fare ready to be taken to their destination. Remember, she's a taxi driver. She picked up the fare outside of a bingo club on Main Street in Camberslang, which, if I'm not mistaken, will have been the Savoy Bingo Club. The building has since been converted into, shock, a Weatherspoons, but the top of the building still has the word Savoy written in huge block capitals, forever reminding the modern patrons of its former glory. Confirmation of this last fare taken on by Catherine came from witness John Liddell, another taxi driver, who had just dropped off a mother and daughter at the same location. John said, I looked across the road and saw Cathy McCord in the driving seat of a cab which was stopped. There was a passenger in the back seat, a blonde man of about 30, wearing a light blue jumper and gold chain. The destination given to Catherine was Brayside Place, a cul-de-sac located half a mile away. Surely the passenger could have walked, I hear you ask. Ordinarily, yes, but this particular passenger had far darker ulterior motives that evening. Brayside Place was chosen for a reason. It wasn't just a cul-de-sac. It was an extremely small and isolated cul-de-sac with a wooded playground area at the end that could be used if a swift unnoticed getaway on foot was required. As Catherine pulled into the cul-de-sac, she suddenly stopped the car before turning all the lights off. Five or so minutes later, the car slowly made its way down to the bottom of the cul-de-sac, still in total darkness, before parking outside one of the apartment buildings. We know this because inside one of the flats within that building were two witnesses who saw the whole thing. James and Jeanette Anderson spotted the car at the top of their road a few minutes after 8pm. Once the car had pulled up, they went about their business. James got himself a nice bath and then proceeded to watch telly for an hour. If any Scottish listeners have any idea as to what he likely would have been watching for an hour at 8pm on a Friday night in Scotland in 1982, please do let me know. There'll still have been only three channels back then, although a month later, Channel 4 would be introduced in November 1982. While watching TV, James was called to the window by Jeanette, who informed him that the taxi was still there and a man was just now getting out of it. About an hour had passed since the car pulled up outside their flat. The stranger wasn't local to the cul-de-sac and his behaviour seemed strange. He went to the back of the taxi, checked the boot, or trunk, then went to the front shut the passenger door, and then walked off. When the programme James was watching had finished, he grabbed his car keys and headed for the nearest petrol station to fill up. It's sickening to think that petrol was about 36 pence per litre back then, because it's just under two quid now where I live, and it's absolutely extortionate. Upon returning home, James's curiosity got the better of him, and he wandered over to the taxi. There was nobody in it. However, James did spot a few items of clothing that appeared to have been carefully tied in neat knots and laid out in a line on the passenger's seat. On the driver's seat, he saw a watch, the car's keys, an inhaler, and the car's cigarette lighter. As with the clothes, they had all been meticulously placed in a straight line. A bit weird? Sure, but was anything really worth worrying about? Would he be given a caution for wasting police time if he rang 999? He pondered over that decision before eventually phoning the police at 1.30 in the morning. They arrived shortly after, and nobody could have predicted what they would find. Inside the car's boot was the body of a woman who appeared to have been stabbed in her neck and chest. It was Catherine McCord. A post-mortem would later confirm she'd been stabbed once in the back of her neck and three times in her chest. James described to the police what he had seen that night and gave a brief description of the man who had walked away from the crime scene. He was estimated at being in his early 30s, which tied up with what John Liddell had said. He was also said to have been around 5 foot 9 or 10, with brown hair this time, not blonde, grey eyes, and wearing a chain around his neck, so again, that last piece of information was consistent. The police made an announcement later that day on October 2nd, 1982, in which they requested every single female taxi driver in Glasgow to come in voluntarily for questioning. The reason wasn't because any of the other taxi drivers were considered suspects, rather it was more of a process of elimination to confirm the body belonged to Catherine McCord. The officer who led the murder inquiry was Detective Superintendent Ian Smith, who said, We estimate there are between 25 and 30 female taxi drivers licensed in Glasgow. 
Our inquiries have revealed that a woman taxi driver uplifted a fare in Main Street, Camberslang, opposite the Savoy Bingo Hall, sometime between 7.30pm and 8pm on Friday. At the moment, there is no indication of a motive. Heartbreakingly, Catherine's husband Eddie only found out that his wife had died when he heard it on the radio the morning after she was killed. He had grown worried when she didn't return home that night after her shift, and all the local taxi drivers were keeping their eyes peeled in the hope they would find her. Forensic experts examined Catherine's taxi and found several bloodstains all over the interior. A couple of bricks had also been placed by the front wheel to prevent the car from rolling away. Robert McLaren was the scenes of crime officer, or SOCO, and he managed to secure a couple of fingerprints from inside the taxi. Only one of the two fingerprints had a match. It belonged to Catherine's husband, Eddie. The other could not be matched to anyone. Robert felt that the complete lack of any other fingerprints indicated that the killer had likely made an attempt to wipe the car clean so as to prevent him from possibly being identified. Disturbingly, it's believed that Catherine's killer remained in the taxi for close to an hour after murdering her before walking away. It was during that time that he'd organised her clothes and belongings in an almost ritualistic way on the two front seats. Seeing as they had nothing to work with other than one witness's rather vague description of a male flea in the scene, the case remained unsolved. DNA wouldn't be used in a criminal case until 1986, four years later, so it's fair to say a lot of murders likely went unsolved back then. Almost two months to the day after the murder of Catherine, on December 2nd, 1982, 48 year old nurse Elizabeth Walton had met her friend Sheila Little for a meal at a restaurant in George Square, the principal civic square in the city of Glasgow. Elizabeth lived at Stewart and Drive in Camberslang and worked as a midwife at Rotten Row Maternity Hospital. The hospital is now part of Glasgow Royal Infirmary after relocating there in late 2001. Sheila and Elizabeth had been friends for decades and they were the same age, so they probably met in high school. They were eating pretty late, so by the time they asked for the bill, it was around half ten in the evening. The plan was for Elizabeth to ring Anne, her eldest daughter, who would then come and collect her from Camberslang Railway Station. Mobile phones were still a few years away from being introduced to the general public, so the call will have been made either via a telephone at the restaurant or from a nearby payphone. Elizabeth was unable to reach Anne, the line was engaged, so the two women decided to walk the half-mile journey to Glasgow Central Station in the hope that, on the way, they'd probably stumble across another phone box and Anne could be called once more. Another phone box could not be found on the five-minute journey, so the pair boarded the train to Camberslang at 10.50pm, as it was already at the station when they arrived. The journey to Camberslang takes around 10-15 to 15 minutes on the train, so they probably got into their local station anywhere between 11pm and 11.15pm realistically. They said their goodbyes and walked home separately in their respective directions. Sheila would later say, she got off the train and on the platform she turned and smiled and waved at me. I never saw her alive again. At some point on her 15 minute walk home, Elizabeth was taken by surprise by a stranger and subjected to a series of brutal attacks. Prepare yourselves. Elizabeth was firstly punched in the head by her attacker, likely unexpectedly and from behind, which knocked her to the floor unconscious. She was then carried by her assailant to an area of wasteland between Westcote's primary school and Kirkhill train station, about a third of a mile away from her home on Stewart and Drive. The area is no longer barren, there's new builds there now, but this was 40 years ago. Once in the secluded wasteland, Elizabeth was strangled with a piece of string and stabbed repeatedly with a knife all over her body, arms and legs. Her clothing was then removed and her bra was forced into her mouth. Having successfully murdered Elizabeth, her killer then carved a series of wounds in her legs with the knife before neatly folding her clothes and organising them in a straight line next to her body. If this was a calling card, it was identical to the one used when Catherine McCord was killed. The following morning, Sheila had no idea that her best friend was missing until her son woke her up to inform her that the police were searching for her as she hadn't arrived home the night before. I didn't find out exactly how Elizabeth Walton's body was found, or by whom, but I do know she was discovered exactly where her killer had left her on the barren wasteland. Near the crime scene, police set up headquarters in a police caravan and commenced with their door-to-door -door investigation. 
Surely someone in the local neighbourhood had to know something about what had happened. What the police didn't expect was the killer coming to them and inadvertently making himself a key suspect in the murder investigation. Ian Scowler strolled over to the police caravan three days after they discovered Elizabeth Walton's body and explained how he had some vital information that may assist them with their search for a killer. Ian said that on the evening of December 2nd, shortly before 11pm, he had seen a man acting rather strangely near the crime scene. He was in the bushes and may have even been hiding or scouting for places to hide. After describing the man as best he could, Ian was then asked about what he was doing there that night and what his movements were after he saw the stranger. Ian said he'd been at the pub until half ten and was on his way to another pub, the Kirkhill Inn, but he wasn't allowed in due to them having called last orders. He said he saw the stranger shortly after that whilst making his way back home, where he arrived at 11pm. Unfortunately for Ian, his solicitous mother would inadvertently provide witness testimony that proved he was lying to the police, and she would ultimately lead to him getting caught for both murders. Seeing as they had no other suspects, the police were interested in Ian Scowler enough to warrant them paying a visit to his home at Kirkton Road. Not concerned by what they may find, Ian agreed when the officers asked if they could search his bedroom. Hidden inside LP record sleeves were five, quote, girly magazines. I assume that term refers to old pin-up magazines such as Parade and Playboy. Clearly Ian was hiding them from his mother's prying eyes. More importantly, the police found a pair of grey trousers that would go on to provide key forensic evidence linking Ian to one of the crimes. In total, the police interviewed Ian Scowler 10 times between December 1982 and January 1983 and his parents became increasingly frustrated as a result. Two letters were sent to the chief constable through a law firm to complain about the police harassing their son. When nothing came of those, Ian's mum Jean decided to pay the officers a visit. Not knowing the story her son had told the police regarding his whereabouts on the evening of December 2nd, 1982, Jean essentially put Ian in the shit when she revealed he hadn't got home until 1am the following morning, not 11pm as he had told them previously. Jean would always stay up late and wait for Ian to return home whenever he went out to make sure he returned safe and sound. She also couldn't sleep until he was home, so if he hadn't returned before her bedtime, she would often go out looking for him. That's exactly what she did on December 2nd. She told the officers she was looking out of the window for Ian until 11pm before she got in the car and drove around looking for him. Two hours later she spotted Ian running towards the car out of nowhere. He told her that he'd visited his friend after the pub before heading to the park to mull over a few things that were playing on his mind, such as potentially moving out and finding a place of his own. Believing his story, Jean took him home and they went to sleep. This new information led to Ian being called to Rutherglen Police Station on December 22nd, 1982, where he was questioned about what his mother had told them. He arrived with his father and changed his story. He now said that he hadn't gone straight home after seeing the stranger by the crime scene. Instead, he had visited a friend before heading to Camberslang Park, where he was until 1am. His story then changed again when he said, in fact, he hadn't been at a friend's house at all. This was something I invented, he said casually. Jean Scowler's second trip to the police station was what really sealed her son's fate. Again protesting his innocence, she said, It's a wonder you're not blaming him for the taxi murder. It's as well as he was at home with his father and I that night. The police hadn't even considered linking the two murders to one killer until she said that, but you better believe that's exactly what they did after hearing that from her. Whilst his grey trousers were being analysed, Ian was said to have been spotted by a couple of witnesses running past Camberslang Shopping Centre not long after the police believe Elizabeth Walton was murdered. Another police questioning session focused on whether or not Ian owned an anorak, as it was believed that Elizabeth Walton was strangled using the cord from such a coat. He admitted to owning one, and was then asked why the cord was missing from the hood and waist. The explanation was a simple one. He'd taken them out because he didn't find them comfortable, and had lost them when the family moved home. On Friday, January 21st, 1983, Ian was visited at work by Detective Sergeant Richard Gray and another officer, who asked him to join them back at Rutherglen Police Station again. When questioned about the missing cord from his anorak once more, Ian this time said he used them as bootlaces, something which his foreman at work would later confirm. 
The analysis of the grey trousers then finally came back and provided compelling evidence. Forensic scientist Keith Aynan carried out tests on the blood and clothing of Catherine, Elizabeth and Ian. Both women had blood type O positive, the most common blood type, and Ian had type A positive, the second most common blood type. A blood smear was found on the grey trousers that could have come from Catherine and or Elizabeth. Eight animal hairs were found that matched the ones on Elizabeth's fur coat. A nylon fibre was found that matched Elizabeth's torn tights. Dried grass flower tops were found which matched those at the railway embankment where Elizabeth's body was found. Ian was subsequently charged with Elizabeth Walton's murder on January 28th, 1983. So the evidence clearly pointed towards Ian having killed Elizabeth Walton. But what about Catherine McCord? On February 25th, 1983, James and Jeanette Anderson were called to a police ID parade, or lineup, in which Ian was one of the six men they could choose from as having been the man they saw leaving the abandoned taxi on the night Catherine was murdered. James picked Ian right away, but Jeanette wasn't sure. That being said, when asked again during Ian's trial if she saw the man who had exited the taxi in the courtroom, she pointed at Ian and said, That is the man. Ian was then formally charged with Catherine McCord's murder as well. At the trial, which commenced in May 1983, Ian denied both murders and lodged a special defence of alibi for both. For Catherine's murder, his alibi was that he'd been playing snooker at a local bowling club before meeting Irina for a drink and then going home. He was sticking to his fabricated stories that seemed to change every time the police spoke to him. When called to the stand, Irina said that Ian had told her he'd been with a friend on December 2nd, 1982, but later changed his story and told her he'd been alone in the park. She recalled him looking tired the following day and pointed out that he was alone in the park the same night Elizabeth Walton had been murdered. Ian simply said, I did not murder her. During the trial, Ian claimed that throughout his frequent interrogation sessions, the police would repeatedly punch him and grab him by the throat in order to coax a confession out of him. He said, One detective snipped hair from my head and private parts and told me, If the scissors slipped, it's your hard luck. Two psychiatrists were then called to the stand and they explained that Ian had an extreme psychopathic and dangerous personality disorder. On the final day of the trial, the jury retired for three and a half hours before returning with their verdicts. For the murder of Catherine McCord, the jury found Ian Scowler guilty by way of a majority verdict. For the murder of Elizabeth Walton, the jury found Ian guilty by way of a unanimous decision. He was handed two life sentences at Glasgow High Court on Monday, June 6, 1983, with a minimum term to serve of 20 years. Sentencing Judge Lord Allenbridge said in his closing statement, Both attacks were of a brutal nature in cold blood and were most terrible and the second killing was particularly horrifying. I consider you are an extremely dangerous young man. 20 years from 1983 takes us to 2003, a date that I mentioned at the very start of this episode. Now you may be shocked to hear that Ian Scowler was released from jail in 2003, and if he's still alive now, is a free man. Catherine McCord's wife Eddie begged and pleaded for the parole board not to let him free, as he believed Ian would kill again. He said, this man killed my wife. He should never have been allowed out as he will surely kill again. No woman is safe when he is around. During the trial he showed no expression of remorse or concern for the consequences of his actions. He used to sneer, chew gum and joke with the police officers in the dock. This is a man who killed because of the publicity and notoriety it would bring him. He wanted his 15 minutes of fame and he will kill again. He has finished his sentence, but the families of his victims are left with the life sentence. We will take this to our graves. Ian moved in with his older sister Morag at her flat, and his story goes cold from there. One would assume he changed his identity after he was released from prison. And that was the story of British murderer Ian Scowler. Thanks again to Keita Wilde for suggesting that case. I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on it especially given the fact Ian is now a free man. Also, if he hadn't walked into the police caravan with tales of seeing a stranger that didn't exist, would he have ever been caught? Would he have gone on to kill more women? Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments or on social media. I've got two new reviews to read out this week. Thank you firstly Shannon Feeney for leaving a 5 star review on BritishMurders.com. Shannon says, 
I can honestly say having this podcast on makes my job more bearable. Gets to the point and I've found some super interesting facts out. Also sent you over an email of some interesting cases. And thank you Apple Podcast user Jane Sharp for leaving British Murders a 5 star review. Jane said, This has to be the best murder podcast in my opinion. I may be biased because I'm from Leeds, but I like the Northern accent. Love the special interview episodes. We'll definitely be checking out the books recommended. Keep up the good work and any Leeds cases would be appreciated. Thanks again, Shannon and Jane. Suppose you'd like to leave a review of the show and have it read on a future episode. You can do so on iTunes, Facebook, Podchaser, or at BritishMurders.com. You can also leave star ratings on Spotify. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee, you can find the links for each of those on my website. Thank you again, Shannon Feeney, for buying me a beer via BuyMeACoffee.com slash BritishMurders. Shannon said, Love the combination of storytelling and interviews. The information is succinct, specific, and with a spice of humour, told in a way that Aussies understand culturally specific terms. Thank you. Shannon also recently became a member of the show's Patreon, so thanks once again, you're a bloody legend. I've also added both of your case suggestions to my spreadsheet to cover in future episodes. My final thank you this week goes to Samantha Woodhouse, who has also joined the show's Patreon. Cheers, Samantha, and welcome. The benefits of Patreon, by the way, is you do get the episodes a day or two early and it is ad-free. It's the only place you can get ad-free episodes if you fancy it. Please continue to email your case suggestions to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or message me via social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll also get a cheeky shout out. That's it for now. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.